So, yeah, while you're doing that, as you know, we're into our Willowburn Leadership Month. So we've had a few different sermons and teaching times on leadership and followership. And this is the, I think, third or fourth one. We've got one more after this. And just, um... <laughs> So interestingly, 12 months ago, almost to the day, I preached a sermon called How is the Church Supposed to Roll? And the whole idea was that we would look at Willowburn Church and we would look at the Bible Church, as in from early Acts, because remember at that time we just finished going through Acts, and we had this sort of idea or this theme of the church on the porch. And we asked a couple of questions about how is the church supposed to roll, and there are actually 10 key principles that came out of a church on the porch. And so I kind of think it's symmetrical that 12 months later, we're going through a bit of a leadership process, and the question we can ask is, how are church leaders supposed to roll? Because if the church is supposed to roll in a certain way, it stands to reason that leaders, Christian leaders, in so much as they're servant leaders, we'll hear more about this in a minute, are going to be equipping the church, serving the church, so that she might roll effectively. Now, again, you could find so much on Google. I mean, there's 189 million results on church leadership alone. There's probably just as many books in many ways or things that have been written. And so when we ask the question, how are church, be church leaders supposed to do things? It's a really important question, I think, but it's really easy to get distracted by all the stuff that's out there. So hopefully this is just bring it back to the scriptures. It's a 6,000 foot kind of perspective. It's a forest perspective, not so much down in the detail of a particular passage. So you can follow along with your Bible there or your iPhone or whatever. Um, follow along with different key verses that I'm going to use. But it's going to be this wide-sweeping kind of perspective about how a church leader's supposed to roll. We have so many different leaders, don't we? We have visionary leaders, administrative leaders, academic leaders, mega church leaders, micro church leaders, flat structures, authoritarian structures, congregational governance, the man of God idea, governance. Um, and sometimes you think, though, we're kind of not rolling real well. We're rolling like that. It's the same kind of picture. I've gratuitously used it again. It saved me some time from 12 months ago. And you kind of go, well, why aren't we rolling? And I think it's important to understand that where are we rolling to in the first, in the first place? I mean, what is the heart of a leader in terms of in 20 years, in 30 years, for each of you people that God sees really, really clearly now and then, what does God want for you? What does he want for you collectively as a church? Is it like this just a massive church? of um, This church in Nigeria, I showed this last time 12 months ago. It's got a seating capacity with overflow outside of 250,000. It apparently is the biggest church in the world. You thought it was in America. I thought it was in Texas. It's not. It's there in Nigeria, which is really cool. All those people hearing about the Lord Jesus. But is that our picture of success? Or is it just, you know, being able to be in command of a great big mega church or concert or conference and everybody just hanging on every word, is is that what leadership success is? And what I want to say, whatever it is, is that leadership success for church leaders, for Christian leaders, for leaders who want to follow the Lord Jesus is church success. Do you know what I'm saying there? So leadership success, if leaders are successful in the calling that God has put on them, will mean church success. And so that then comes again to, well, what is church success? What are we supposed to be doing? Remember a few weeks ago, I asked that question, what are we doing? What are we doing as a church? We are reading lots, arguing lots, doing lots of therapy, writing lots of books. Do, do you remember what we were supposed to be doing out of all that? We're here to love, here to, here to, here to love, here to serve, here to grow, here to love. God, because he's really cool, he's done cool things, here to love each other, all the commandments, all your um, holiness in a sense in terms of expressing itself through the law and so forth, it's all there to love. And then we talked about um, we're here to serve, because service, thanks to Benno again, service is love made visible, work is love made visible. Your everyday work in so much as you go, I'm going to try and do this for the Lord. I'm going to be salt and light. It becomes love made visible. When you serve one another, when you help the Rajas move, 
that is love made visible. And so it speaks so loudly, like it speaks way more loudly than a dodgy preacher like me up the front gobbing off and on and on and on in tongues of angels kind of stuff, you know, with love when it's just a gonging or, or a clanging or a cymbal. <laughs> we do, we do love you. But you know what I mean, it just speaks so loudly. Um, and then we're here to grow, we shouldn't just be stagnating. You know, we had the scriptures for that. We had Jesus who said, I didn't come here to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. Uh, and we see that we're all supposed to be that way. And then he said to Peter that the church will grow. He will build his church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. So we should see it growing. We should see it being built. And each of us we saw have got gifts and divine power you have the holy spirit of god dwelling within you should just be bubbling up wanting to love wanting to serve wanting to see the church grow so that the world out there might be changed for the better so that kingdom culture and kingdom values might come imagine kingdom culture kingdom values in your workplace imagine kingdom Hued leaders with kingdom values and kingdom culture. You know, 80 to 90% of people leave their job because of their bosses. And I dare say that a majority of people leave churches because of leaders. So when we say, how did the early church roll? And then we say, how should leaders roll? I think it's worthwhile going back through these principles that we saw in Acts and various other places and then just sort of superimposing leadership over it. Because if the church is to succeed, then leaders have got to succeed in enabling and facilitating and demonstrating these characteristics of a church on the porch. So, again, just a little bit of revision. The church on the porch was the church in the open. Where do I get that concept from? Well, it's Acts 5, 12 to 14. Uh, we'll be in Acts a bit. You can turn there if you want. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. So... That's actually Solomon's porch. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So imagine that picture of the big old temple there, quite glorious, very extravagant um, fittings that Herod had put on there. You remember the disciples said to Jesus, wow, check out that temple, look how great it is. And Jesus said, that's going to be torn down, not one bit's going to last. However, at the time while the temple was there, before it got torn down by the Romans in about AD 70, the believers, the early believers would meet on the porch. It was just to get out of the hot sun, no doubt. But all, anyone could meet there. The Gentiles, they could meet there because it was the court of the Gentiles. They could come in and they could gather together. And so if you were there, knew nothing about Christ ones, Christians, you would see a bunch of people gathered together. You'd go over and you'd start hearing about this Yeshua or Jesus. And so you could see how far away they were as they were coming. You could also see if people were leaving. There was no walls. There was this sense of centre-bound um, attraction. The centre was Jesus. And the further away you were, the more obvious it was. And the only thing that evidenced the church in those days was not massive buildings, but was, in fact, the gathering. The Greek calls that the ecclesia, the people coming together and nothing has changed in 2,000 years nothing has changed the church at her most fundamental is just you guys gathered together with Jesus on your lips and Jesus on your hearts anywhere where people gather no matter how extravagant they're building it's just Jesus in their hearts Jesus on their lips singing hero songs and people being gravita hopefully gravitating towards that and amazing things happened with the early church. Think about it. They were unschooled men. Imagine if I went down to Eden, which is a, or even no, let's make, bring it home. Let's say uh, I went down to Southport, to the spit there, and a fishing trawl has just come in, and I just go up to two blokes, and I say, do you know that in, within 50 years, you and a bunch of other guys will fundamentally change the whole Australian economic situation, the whole Australian political situation, because of what you do and people that follow you later, in 300 years, it'll be changed. And there's these two gruff fishermen, you know, probably every second word's the F word. You know, they're probably, um, so they smell like fish. That's essentially what Jesus did with Peter and James and John. That's essentially what he did. 
with fishermen. And somehow or another, this little church, this little gathering grew and grew and grew with no professional planning, no professional leaders, no professional training. It just grew and grew and grew and grew. And so I really just want us as a church to look back at that and go, why? Because if remember my last sermon, if Jesus has said it's supposed to be built, then we need to go in terms of a natural system. Well, why is it? What are the blockages? Because a natural system, if he's put written into the DNA of the church that you will be built and you will grow, what are the blockages? And we looked at some of those last time, but this time I want to look at the blockages that might be in leaders. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you see some of these blockages in your leaders, what do you do about it? I'll tell you what most people do about it in most churches when they see leadership going wrong. Depending on how big it is, now I've got some experience with this, um, depending on how big it is, they will tend to do one of probably two things. Just quietly leave. All right? And it might take months, it might take years, but they'll get grow more and more concerned about the way their leaders are behaving, the way some, the direction of the church or certain attitudes, they'll, they'll leave. Or they'll begin to factionalise. So they will gather around them like-minded people. It might happen in a home group. It's, oh, that sermon the other day, far out. What do you think? Oh, I didn't think much of that at all. Yeah, me either. Or it might start... <laughs> no, not at all, Reggie. Um, or it might just simply start with, oh, we really need to pray for this leader. And it's like next thing, these things are coming out. Yeah, yeah, well, let's pray and a prayer gets tacked on the end. But really, at the heart, there's this factionalising. They're starting to form factions. Divisions are starting to occur. Now... I'll be the first to say that in some churches, after much prayer, you do have to probably leave. Um, and sometimes it does mean that other churches are planted and grow. We're one of them. But what I want to say is, is that what is meant to happen? I mean, who should hold leaders accountable? Is it other leaders? Or is it the church themselves? Leaders only exist and are only in place because of you guys. I mean, you could all walk out right now and I could preach to the wall. I can't enforce any of that on you. See, most modern leaders, Mark did so well in the warm-up, brought together all these modern leaders, they have some way of enforcing your followership. Think about it. If you were to rebel against Tony Abbott, he has the full weight of the military, doesn't he? Or the full weight of civil law and the police. If you were in the army to rebel against your commanding officer... He has the full weight of military and the military law. If you were to rebel against your boss, in a sense, he has economic power over you. He won't pay you anymore. Think about Jesus now. What did he have that he held over in his manhood, and he was fully man, fully God, but in his manhood, what did he have that he could enforce followership? He never claimed a title. He could have. We know from the Old Testament he was the ultimate king, the ultimate priest, and the ultimate prophet. He could have claimed all those titles, but he never did. So what was it? What was it? Um, he could have... He had no economic power. He had no celebrity power. Like today there's celebrity power, celebrity authority. You can get followership happening if you're just really popular. And you don't even have to have been a good actor anymore to do that. But like, Jesus had none of that. He could have stopped performing miracles for people. Well, miracles is one thing, but miracles actually got him in trouble later on. If you look at three, after about three uh, years or so, um, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, religious experts, are just saying he's doing it by Satan. So even that. And after a while, he starts bringing some hard teaching, like, you know, in John uh, 6, 7, 8, the kind of, the whole, the whole kind of popularity thing just turns against him. He's... From, it says from there, not many people followed him. I guess what I'm trying to get at, guys, I'm leaving it open-ended because what I want you to do is see that the essence of who Jesus was is the nature of biblical leadership. The essence of uh, who Jesus was should be the nature of church leaders everywhere. No military power, no economic power, no power gradient with which to work from, just a heart that says to God, well, I'm here, I want to serve, I want to help direct and vision and all that kind of stuff, but it's ultimately following you, seeking you. Um, and whatever it is, Lord, would you just would you bring it? And do you remember what Jesus' authority was? Remember when they talked 
when the people would say, this guy preaches with authority, it was an internal authority. It was not military, it was not economic, it was this internal authority. And yeah, the miracles were there, but it was the word that went out. Anyway, that's just the preamble, okay? The first thing I want us to look at in terms of, and there's 10 of them, right? That's where I'm going, there's 10, but we're going to go over them fairly quickly. Um, the first thing about a church on the porch, the early church, was that they were spirit-filled, all of them. God was with them. Acts 10, 38 talks there about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good, healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. God was with Jesus. And then we see that same thing happen in the church in Acts 11, 20 and 21. Um, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So being spirit-filled meant that God was with them. Again, no economic, military, political power, but God was with them. That was so attractional. And God was mystery of mystery in them. Acts 2, 4, all of them were filled with the Spirit. Acts 4, 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, rulers and elders of the people. Then he speaks with power. Acts 13, 19, Saul, the Christian persecutor, becomes Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. And then later on, Paul writing in Ephesians says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're being, if God is with you and God is in you, you have the spirit of Jesus, you have the personality of Jesus. So that same element of leadership for godly leaders should be there as well. And here's the thing about godly leaders. Godly leaders should be spirit-filled like Jesus was spirit-filled. And herein, I think, is probably the first blocker that I'm leading up to. But let's just read 1 Corinthians 2 and 4. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, which was incredibly divided at the time, and yet he still appealed to them to get rid of their divisions and so forth. And he says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. They weren't with enforceable economic power, military power, political power, celebrity power. They weren't with any of that. But with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. On God's power. And here's the first blockage that can happen, happen in a leader. And you know what I'm doing here right now, guys? I'm asking you that if you see certain things like this in any of your leaders, rather than um, quietly fade away and leave me in my sin or start to factionalise, ask that you come and approach us and go, I've seen some things and I'd really like to talk to you about those if you see patterns of behaviour. And I'm also asking that you would pray that these things don't happen. Instead, we would be spirit-filled leaders. So I'm actually saying to you now, I'm submitting and saying, I will be held accountable by you for these things. It's getting recorded. Hopefully it'll record the whole way through. Um, it'll be there. You can come back to this day and go, he asked me to hold him to account. He asked me to hold the other leaders to account. That's what I'm asking. So if you see a blockage of self-powered leadership, and self-powered leadership can be so sophisticated and cool. It can involve massive buildings. It can involve great teaching. It can involve a powerful personality. It can look so godly, but it won't have true Christian fruit. That's how you tell the difference. Long-term fruit. I don't want your faith resting on my ability to organise or my ability to pastor or any of the leaders' abilities to pastor or organise. That's just self-powered stuff. Think stagnant pool versus rushing stream, pure and beautiful. You want to depend on a person, any person at any time? Think stagnant pool. It has the qualities of water, but it's still, it's festering. Think powerful Mountain stream flowing down, flowing through, no blockages. Self-powered leadership. That's the first blockage. Be careful. The church on the pool, the church on the porch had no walls. And so there's some really important in, uh, implications which I mentioned before. Inclusion just involved simply coming. All you had to do was come. Come into the church. 
Maybe it's through a person just sharing. Maybe it's through a person loving, serving. But they come into the church. There's no, um, like the army, there's no interviews required. There's no aptitude testing required. You can just come. And this was so important back then and important now because we think we have to be a certain way to fit in, but the church was diverse. We should enable anyone to come in at any time. There was um, no divisions between Christians that were physical in terms of like a physical wall. It was an open field between them. And like we've said before, it was the church at Corinth, it was the church at Galatia, the church at Willowburn. It was the church. There was no denominational racism. Oh, those charismatics, you can't trust them. Or oh, those Calvinists. Oh. You know, we're already judging a person based on their background. That is racism. There was none of that. Unity was centered, not war bound. It was centered on Jesus, literally. Loss was immediately seen and felt and hurt. And we talked much about this last year. I won't go into a whole bunch of detail, but if you see the church as a big mass of people, as an organism, well, it doesn't really matter if you lose a few skin cells. But if you see the church as individual members, you'll notice if you lose an arm. You'll notice if you lose an e a leg. And that's the, the, the intimacy and the strength of those connections in that oneness. And so the second blockage that I want you to hold us to accountable is if we're ever blockading leaders, if we have somehow built up a church in a sense that's right, this is us, everyone out there, they don't have it together like we do, so yeah, we don't really want you going over there, but you can kind of talk to them if you want to. Um, no, you're, right, you're with us. That's a blockading attitude. That is not the attitude. And we've had people come and go in this church, and it hurts me when they do go. It does. I'm not going to deny that. But if it is better for them to be in another church or another expression of that church, that's fine. And if we can do whatever we can as a church to reach out and bring that oneness in the church as a whole so that the watching world might look in and see tangible oneness, that's awesome. Blockading leaders are sometimes a bit more um, subtle, you know. They might, be, they might just be doing it inadvertently. They might not realise that certain attitudes are causing divisions between other churches. I remember when we were in the States, um, just love the church I was in. Anyway, they had this big sort of push in the church uh, or in the little town that we were in. It was about twenty or 30,000 people for all the um, churches to get together and do this particular thing. And I think 90% of the churches did it. And then I was listening to the leaders of this church talk and they go, no, we won't be doing that because it's this denomination. And I was like, oh, I love you guys and you guys have blessed me so much. But when I heard, heard that, it was like a, like a crushing of the heart. It was like, oh, you know, like... Jesus, when he sees his church, he sees his true believers throughout all time. He doesn't see denominational walls or denominational racism. He just sees a bunch of people that when he returns will all rejoice together with a loud shout. So why do we blockade? The church on the porch was a church of the cross daily. Over and over again, you know what our biggest temptation in this society is? And it'll get under our, our skin and into our veins is the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance. Now listen to this. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That implies strongly. There's a strong metaphor there. That was struggle. That was angst. That was hurt. That was pain. What he's saying there in the little things that when you give or you decide that you want to follow Jesus, it's like, okay, that's fine, but do you realize that it's going to hurt you a little bit? If you want to serve, if you want to love, if you want to see the church grow, this is the very thing here that will mark you as different from everyone else because everyone else out there in the world is giving based on their excess or their abundance. What Jesus wants to say to you here is that you will give out of your inadequacy. So the picture that I have of, of this is over there there's a person that's hurt, right? I, I have to limp over there to help them. I'm hurting too. I have issues. It's going to hurt me to go over there. I'm not going to stride over there with a big S on my on my chest and use my super, you know, my heat vision or X-ray vision or whatever. I'm going to have to limp over there. It's going to hurt. 
When you make that meal, it's going to cost you. You're going to be tired. You're going to have a bad attitude alert. A little light going on. Why do I have to do this? Like, I mean, I had a bad attitude alert coming here this morning. That's the flesh speaking, but it's going to cost you something. It's going to hurt you a little bit. They were a church of the cross daily. Read the read Thess- um, Thessalonians. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, in fact, read any part of the Bible, but read the church. Um, uh, I think it's Thessalonica where they just gave and gave and gave and gave because it hurt. I'm not just talking money here, guys. I'm talking time. But when the world looks in and they go, you gave even though it hurt. You limped over and helped me. Whoa. Suddenly the love has power. Maybe that's what Paul was talking about when he talked about the word coming with power because the church actually loved to that degree. So a blockage for a leader will be a suffering denial leader. And I know we see this everywhere. Path of least resistance, your best life now. Like You can't... And I don't think that's out there. I like, don't think that's just some smiling guy out there with lots of books at Kuron. But that actually gets in here with us as well when we go, you know what, I deserve to just... To, have a little bit of a rest now. I don't feel like I need to help. I've done my bit. That is suffering denying. And if we leaders are like that, I want you to help us because we should be right down in the trenches with you. We are no different. The church on the porch devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. You know what I see there? They just devoted themselves to simple things, but they did them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, just like a wheel spinning. That's why I got the whole let's the way we roll kind of thing. A, a wheel is just spinning, 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 doing simple things over and over and over again, and it's getting somewhere. We just need to be consistent with reading the word, preaching the word, teaching the word. We need to be consistent with fellowshipping, getting together, not just in big groups like this, not just on Thanksgiving dinners, they're really special, but getting together one with another, supporting each other in your marriages or in your singleness, getting together, doing that kind of thing, it will change you, it will make God more real to you. The breaking of bread, that's why we have communion here every day, and to prayer, just simple things, and yet in our world we see big, complex programs and vision statements and all the rest of it, and it just kind of congests the soul. It turns a round wheel into a square wheel. It makes everything hard. So if you have process program-driven leaders, I'm not saying processes or programs in themselves are bad, but if that becomes the driving factor, I want you to hold us to account. I want you to say, well, we've got too many complex programs. I'm not really tracking with where this is going. Help us with that. It might be building programs in the future. Now, again, a building program might be a God-ordained thing, but think to yourself for a minute, like even just to even just to get that thing up and running, you're talking lots of time, let alone the money, you're talking lots of time. Is that going to help us? And this is how you clarify and purify your thinking whenever the church is about to do something. You pray about it and you say, Lord, is this going to help us to love? Is this going to help us to serve? Is this going to help us to grow? Sometimes it'll be a simple, no, it's not. Let's do something else. But watch out, because that will become a blockage. Your program will congest the work of the Spirit. The church on the porch had a membership of the heart. There were no written contracts of the pen. There were no creedal confessions. Nowadays, because we're a written culture, we like covenants and contracts and all the rest of it, and we like to somehow make that the... um, the branch to the person. So we'll get the contract and that will become the branch to the person that will hold them into the trunk. No, it's the heart. Remember what, what attracted people to Jesus? He didn't get them to write contracts. It was something that was going on inside of him. It was the Holy Spirit. It was God at work. And that's what we want as well. And so, yes, we will have formalized uh, membership in a sense that we know who our members are. As we've already seen, we've kind of seen that through a time of crisis. Um, but we're not getting you to write contracts and things like that. You guys are here because you want to be here. You guys are here because the Lord's powering you up. And so watch out for legalism in your leaders, for contract seeking, for trying to get things written down so that we can kind of hold something over you in a way. And it never works anyway. People just nick off anyway. So 
think of Jesus, no authority structure to back him, like I said, no rank, no office, no economic power, and yet people follow him. Um, this one here is so important for our intellectual age. The church on the porch was a church deprofessionalized. It was those smelly fishermen and tax collectors, you know, state traders. Uh, they were people that, you know, there were professionals, don't get me wrong, they were professional, as in people who'd been trained in the church, but they were few and far between. The majority of the work was done by the average person, whether it was a fisherman or a tax collector or a doctor or a servant in Caesar's household. They were unschooled, ordinary men, and yet they spoke with power. I mean, listen to this, Acts 4.13, when they, the schooled professionals, the Pharisees who'd been trained academically, saw the courage of Peter and John and realised they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Acts 8, 4, Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. And John Piper wrote a book about his brothers. We're not professionals. Love for you to read that if you get a chance. Remember, the thing that we often speak about here is let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you, what? Teach and admonish who? One another. Do you realise there's an accountability on you to preach and teach in a testimonial way, one to another. Of course, there'll still be people, I guess, like me, who stand up and preach in a more formal way. We're not saying get rid of those preachers. We're actually saying add to it. Let everyone be a preacher in their own way as God has gifted them, whether it's just through testimony or whether it's up the front. Let them preach. Let us do that simple thing of the word well and comprehensively. And so a blockage would be professional leaders. You go, you know what, we can't do this unless we get a professional seminary trained guy in here. So let's not do anything until we do. So you do get your professional seminary trained guy in here, rightio, just like the Israelites wanted king, like King Saul, like everyone else had king, so we want a king too. Well, you do get him in, and he'll bring in his professional trained agenda. Now, he may or may not be, or she may or may not be nowadays, a spiritual, spirit-filled person. If they're a spirit-filled person, cool. God's going to deal with any kind of professional pride. But if they're not... Watch out, because you will end up with a Saul in charge or something worse. Professional leaders have never been enablers to the church. Never. In the first few decades, it was just all the smelly fishermen and the tax collectors. And that's really important for us, I think, in what we want to do, professional leaders. The church on the porch was led by labourers' hands. They worked with them. 18.3, so in Acts 18.3, Paul is working with them. Jesus worked for 30 years as a carpenter. That gives leaders a rapport, so we know what it's like for you in your workplace, in your home place. There's not this kind of separation of, oh, it's all up in my head. Um, and I know that, you know, you probably do work out there, but I've never had to do it myself. So that, that gives us an advantage as leaders who have to work side by side with you. And of course... The pluralities, plurality of leaders led by serving. But what I want to say there is that we as leaders should be working ourselves out of a job. And I want to, you may have heard this concept, have you heard the concept of the spider and the starfish before? Okay. Yeah, Raji, you're nodding your head. What is it? No, that's all right. So... So a guy's written a book, I can't remember his name either, right? But one of the things he did was he analysed headless systems. So you've got a spider, you crush its head, all its legs become inoperative as it dies. Um, the starfish, do you know what's unique about a starfish? Every part of the starfish has within each part of its cells all the requisite information, DNA, etc., to replicate itself. So you can cut off one leg of the starfish, doesn't matter that leg in a short amount of time, or a long amount of time, depending on what type, will become another starfish. And so this guy, who's not even a Christian, he wrote this book and he talked, looked at ISIS, he looked at uh, Montezuma and the Aztecs and how their empire fell when their leader was crushed, and he looked at the church. And he goes, hmm, this is interesting. Because the church had no big leaders, no um, professional leaders. It had all these guys that were just led by labourers and tent makers and whatever else. And so what that meant, it was like a starfish. You could, you could persecute it, you could come in and harass it, but all it did was spread, and wherever it spread, like a little starfish, little more starfishes started to appear. 
Now, if it had been like the church in Rome right now, you just take out the Pope, take out all the all the you know the headquarter element of whatever, however the Vatican works, and the whole church at that time will collapse. But God's plan was that it would be like a starfish, and so within this building there should be the elements. If we were to scatter and spread, or if we got to a hundred or two hundred or whatever, if we were to scatter and spread, all of a sudden all these little starfish appear everywhere. That's the concept. And what that means is one blockage would be that you need your kind of logos for MacBook leaders, you know what I mean there? These guys are not laborers, they're not actually there in, in a sense side by side. They're back behind their desks with all these plans and everything else. Everyone knows what logos is, maybe not. It's just this Bible program that is kind of cool to have if you're a church leader. I've got it. Um, and MacBooks, most church leaders that are cool have MacBooks as you can tell. <laughs> There's a bit of advertising for Apple. Um, but our point there is is that within this little church, there are bunches of people and your leaders, you want them side by side. You don't want them up here. You don't want them as single points of failure. Go and research some stuff that's happened in the church recently over in the States where single points of failure, multi-site, multi-site multi-campus churches, the spider, you crush the head, what happens? Um, the church on the porch is a church, and we're nearly there, guys, decisioning together. They, the church, thought it best to. You see that a few times in Acts. They, the church, in big major decisions. Have a look at Acts 15. If there was conflict, they made it over ground. They took it to the church as a whole. In fact, Matthew 18 says to do that. If you've got conflict, you go to them first, then you take some people, then you take it to the church. Not so that everyone can be ashamed, even though it is going to be awkward and yucky, but so that it might be dealt with and all the shadows are removed at that point. So you know when there's conflict, if you don't haven't heard the other person's side, there's going to be shadows and from the shadows come arrows, from the shadows come suspicion. When you get together and, and everyone gets an opportunity to share their side, guess what? All the shadows disappear. That's God's wisdom there. Decisioning together. And if we ever become cockpit leaders, like I'm a pilot, so I understand what this means. If you get into my helicopter, okay, I might give you a few announcements here and there, but you have no control over where I take you. Same, same in the jet that I'm going to get into today. I'll hear a few cabin announcements. But I've got no control. That's not how the church is supposed to act. All right? But make no mistake, leaders are still leaders. They still have to give an account to God. But they should be talking to you regularly, all the time. They should be next to you. Help, help us, help you, hold us accountable to that. The church on the porch is um, giving it's giving, and you know, Jesus was so giving, God was so giving, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, it's Christmas time, we should be giving, and we've got to make sure that we don't become misdirected fundraising leaders, that might be a building program, it might be some sort of program we think is really important, but it might actually be congesting what God wants us to do, I'm so thankful that we don't draw a salary, that allows us to free up our funds to give to Big Dog or to gospel for age. And I just really want to see that start to kind of erupt in the church, like to become a deluge of giving. I think that would be so cool. Watch out, it doesn't become a blockage. The church is multiplying, not just enlarging like a cluster. Remember we talked about this last year. Cancer is the only thing that grows into a cluster in nature and keeps growing and growing and growing. Everything else splits and divides and multiplies. Mum and dads come together, kids happen, kids grow up, kids marry other kids, and, mum, and their mums and dads are like, that's the nature of growth, and that's the nature of church growth. Again, within here, if we were to grow, we grow at about 100 or so, and then there's probably going to be enough people to maybe plan another church. And so it continues to multiple, multiply and grow. Watch out for cluster growth leaders. They want to gather around themselves, and this could happen in us as well. Hey, this is pretty cool. Got 100 people now, got 150, got 200. Let's keep going. This is good. The band's really rocking now. Like, that's not what God has intended. I'm not having a go at big churches, but I'm just saying they pierce themselves with many griefs, I think, if it's not done properly and well, and they set themselves up for temptation to be the celebrity leader. So watch out for that. Help us. And, of course, and this is the last one, I think. Actually, second last. <clears throat> no, it is the last um, the church on the porch was a church that made every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit. You can see that in Acts 15. And it was the church at Ephesus, at Thessalonica, at Corinth, at Jerusalem, and now through time at Willowburn, at Eastgate, at Humeridge. 
And what if every effort was made to maintain the unity or to reconcile? We've had some sweet times of reconciliation even with some people at Eastgate in recent times. What if we just um, criticised less and instead tried to help? And I think if you ever see leaders that are spending a lot of their time writing blogs about other leaders, it's going to be a blockage. So help us. So the way we roll, we don't need more books, more programs, more conferences, more talk. We need to keep things simple. Okay? We need spirit-filled leaders. We need spirit-filled congregational members to hold us accountable. So therefore, we need to be praying and asking God to fill us with his spirit every day. We need to be people of the book, not just reading but living it out because we are here to love. We are here to serve. We are here to grow. And so ultimately, is it are the leaders helping us to love, serve, grow? Um, I'm going to finish with this because this is key. If you ever want to think, why are we here? What's this all about? Come back to Ephesians 4. So this is Paul writing, and this is what we're going to finish with as we go into communion. He who descended is the very one, he's talking about Jesus, who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So that Galilean carpenter, 30 years or so, three years of ministry, three days of suffering and resurrection, has now taken up royalty again. He now has economic, military, um, celebrity power. He has it all. All the glory. Angels think he's really cool. He has it all. We sang about him as the mediator, so he's speaking on our behalf. I really like that. It was this Christ, so Jesus himself, who's up there, royalty, power, etc., who gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to what? To equip you for works of service. Actually, in the King James, that's for ministry. It's the same word. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's what your leaders want to do. That's what we want to happen to us as well. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. See, a church member like that is not going anywhere. It's not under power. It's being just driven along by whatever wind comes along. That's not how we want to be as a church. That's, that's not growth. That's not building. By every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him... The whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. 